will give the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. With five seconds, he's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown. Carolina back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. There is a flag down. But holy smokes. Duke two and four in overtime games. Carolina one and three. Here from under center. Give off to Greg Little. Little pulls away. Little is going to score. Carolina wins. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And Nick it's Walker <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it! Possible win. Snap. Spot. Kick away. High enough. Long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunterburn. In his end zone. The punt. Very high. Switzer will have room to return it. He feels it at the 40. Coming near side, Switzer at the 50. Switzer, 45, cuts back at the 40. 35, breaks a tackle at the 30. Still on his feet. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Ryan Switzer for six. He is doing his best Giovanni Bernard impression. Ryan Switzer again. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it for a touchdown. Are you kidding me? What's going on, guys? Another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast here with you guys. On a Sunday evening, uh, as the Tar Heels in the offseason uh, officially and uh, college football in the offseason officially. A lot of moves going on around mm-hmm. college football. That means that there are some guys uh, that are going to be freed up in the transfer portal with Nick Saban leaving Alabama, with Kalen DeBoer then following and leaving Washington, and the domino effect is on. So another round of the transfer portal going to be happening here soon. We're going to update you on where things are in the transfer portal for Carolina uh, to this point. Uh, since the last time we were on here, the team's landed two uh, transfers in this window that they're hoping can come in and play pretty significant roles for the team this year. They also have a guy that they are valuing pretty highly that's going to be visiting this weekend. We'll tell you about him. And ultimately, the big question has to be mm-hmm. asked. Do we like the approach that Carolina is taking to the transfer portal with just six commitments so far, only one other real target out there at this point? Uh, But it seems like this is still a team that has a lot of needs heading into next year. So is this the right strategy or do we think that Mac Brown and his staff are not putting their priorities where they need to be? Um, You know, since the last time that I was on here, uh, you know, I was on here by myself. Uh, Josh has not had a chance to react to the coordinator hire of Jeff Collins. So that's how I want to start out, really just by asking you, you know, what you make of of that hire. I think, you know, on the night of it, a lot of people really weren't that high on it. But as we've gotten further and further away, I feel like this is sort of similar to what we saw with the Chip Lindsey hire, where people look at it now, and and I think to – uh, you know, a more uh, a bigger extent. This is one where yeah. you kind of had to grow on this hire because, frankly, yeah. you weren't really getting anybody much better to leave a job that they were currently at. Um, but this is one that I think people are starting to warm up to a little bit more now and are hopeful that this can be uh, someone that can help this Carolina defense. I mean, I think – on the surface, it was as good as a hire as Carolina was was going to make. Because um, if we're being honest, it's not that attractive of a position. Uh, just given the struggles we've seen on that side of the ball for the last decade or so. But you're getting a guy that, um, you know, has coordinated defenses at a high level in Power 5 conferences. 
Um, so, you know, th- it's not like when you brought – um, when you brought Jay Bateman in and he was making the jump up from the group of five triple option offense where his defense was always rested, well, that's not going to be the case with Jeff Collins. He's also a former head coach in this league. So he's going to know um, the tendencies of these teams as well as any other coordinator you could have hired. And what you're hoping he helps you as much as anything on the field is being able to go into living rooms in the Georgia area, in that Atlanta footprint, um, and help recruit defensive talent to to come to Carolina. So he has his work cut out for him. Um, I think we said when we were going through our candidates, he was probably the best that Carolina was was going to get. Um, and ultimately, Mac Brown was able to get his guy, and now we just got to rally behind him and and see what kind of job we he can do. Because again, we're not asking him to to move mountains, or you know, we're not asking to <clears throat> play defense like like Georgia does or like Alabama does. We're simply asking get us average, and we'll see where the dominoes fall. So, um, all in all, it was the best hire Mac Brown and, and Carolina could have made this off season. Yeah, and look, he's already out there on the recruiting trail, trying to establish connections with some of the guys that Carolina has signed in the early signing class. He's also out there trying to sort of blaze some new paths. And look, he was away from the game for only one year. And that was one of the other big selling points that I had when it came to him for this job. I mean, look, you you brought in two guys that, that are defensive coordinators the first two times under Mac Brown here in his second stint. One was from Army where you really couldn't recruit. You kind of just had to take the guys that were willing to sign up and and, and go through everything that you had to be uh, or had to do to be a part of West Point. And then you brought in Gene Chizik, who had been away from the game for five years. Uh, it was clearly you know not established in some of the recruiting areas that were different that this staff was attacking as opposed to the one that Larry Fedora and his staff were attacking at the time. And, and you're seeing why Carolina you know, has sort of struggled with both of those guys. This is a guy that, yeah, he's been removed from the game for a year, but still he knows everything uh, you know, that the, the game has to offer. He's not going to be shocked like Gene Chizik was, saying that there were things, there were elements of the game that uh, he just was not expecting, he couldn't keep up with. Um, Jeff Collins is a guy that hasn't coordinated a defense since 2017. But, I mean, when you go back and look at some of those defenses that he coordinated, they were really, really good. And I think the thing is, is that people are worried about the talent level. But it's like I said, I think the talent is probably – is on this roster. It shows with the way that this, you know, staff has recruited. Um, it's just about developing. And hopefully, you know, Ted Monachino is a guy that can do that. Uh, there's, you know, you, it, it's one of those things where he really has to because he's not really going to be able to do much for you recruiting wise. It's been a very long time since Monachino has had to go out and recruit. You're relying on a guy like Jeff Collins, who probably has a little bit more left in the tank and a little bit of fire to be able to go out there and do that for you. But ultimately, um, you know, I think it's one that I liked at the time. And I, I think as people have started to see it more, they're starting to like it themselves. And hopefully it's just, you know, something that you're hoping that there's a chance that all he can do is get you to an average defense. In terms of defensive efficiency, Carolina's had one defense that has ranked inside of the top 70 in the last 10 years. So even getting to an average defense would be huge for this group if they could be somewhere in the 50s in defensive efficiency it would help this team out so much well you know what else could help this uh, team out would be a guy like uh julius peppers who found out last week that he is heading to the college football hall of fame later on this year it'll be in december of course before uh, the Peach Bowl down there in Atlanta. They will host a ceremony, and uh, he, he finally gets in. Uh, this is one that took way too long. The fact that he was on the ballot for three years is insane, but he becomes Carolina's 11th representative in the College Football Hall of Fame. 
seven players prior, three coaches prior. Um, and this is this is a pretty special one because uh, this could be the start of just a huge year. I mean, look, he already went into the Panthers uh, ring of honor. Uh, he, he had been in there for uh, or he went in earlier this year, uh, which was a huge honor for him. And then he now follows it up with his college football career being honored. And look, in three years at Carolina, 167 total tackles, 53 tackles for loss, 30 and a half sacks, which is second in program history, 42 quarterback pressures, five interceptions, 13 pass deflections, five forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, just a guy that did it all. And really, he set the stage for exactly what his NFL career would be um, as a guy that pulled down interceptions, pass deflections, just because of how athletic he was. Uh, his you know freshman year wasn't the greatest, 50 total tackles, 10 tackles for loss, six sacks. That would still be more than welcome um, you know, on, on this year's roster. Um, but you know, in, in comparison to his other years, it might not have been the greatest, but he really breaks out his sophomore season. NCAA leading 15 sacks, finished third in the nation with 24 tackles for loss, named a first team all ACC selection and second team all American selection. Really, that was the best year of his career, although he was recognized more for his junior year in 2001, uh, finished the season with 19 ta uh, tackles for loss, five, nine and a half sacks, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. and finished with three interceptions, one of which he returned for a touchdown, an amazing stat as a defensive lineman. He was named first team all ACC for the second straight year, but was also named a unanimous first team all-American. And then, of course, he gets drafted second overall pick by the Carolina Panthers, one of three Tar Heels that had been selected number two overall. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to put mm -hmm. together one of the greatest careers of any edge rusher in the history of the National Football League. Uh, you know, two stints in Carolina, has, uh, you know, short stints with the Chicago Bears and before that the Green Bay Packers. Um he finishes his career with 724 total tackles, 175 tackles for loss, uh, 159 sacks, 52 forced fumbles, 21 fumble recoveries, 11 interceptions, and uh, 82 career pass deflections. Just one of the most storied careers of anyone. Mm. When you look at really the college career on top of the NFL career, I mean, about as good as it gets. And you would expect that with those numbers, he's a finalist. You would expect he's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer in the NFL when that comes up later this year. So, I mean, you, when you talk about Julius Peppers, you're talking about one of the greatest players in Carolina football history, one of the most versatile athletes in the history of Carolina athletics, of course, did contribute um, and play probably the biggest role that any you know dual sport athlete that's played football and basketball has made at Carolina. Um, but this is a guy that that has left a pretty significant impact on Carolina, and it feels great to see him go into the College Football Hall of Fame like he deserves. Yeah, you mentioned being a dual athlete. His biggest impact was on the basketball court, where he was a pivotal part of that 2000 team that made the Final Four. And, we, you know, we had a chance to talk to Matt Doherty, who said if he could have played basketball, or if he chose to play basketball, he would have been a Hall of Famer in that sport as well, which just goes to show you the freak that he was. Um, you know, growing up as a young Panther fan, it was fun getting to watch him play um, every Sunday. Of course, him being a Tar Heel made it all the more special. And when you talk about the modern era of the ACC – um, as good a defensive player as this conference has ever seen. Um, you know, and for our program's sake, the second best defensive player right there behind Lawrence Taylor. And we all know how good Elsie was in college, even better once he got to the NFL level. The same thing for Pep, uh, dominant in college, was dominant in the pros. I mean, the guy's a member of two all NFL decade teams. Like, when you're, when you're doing that, you're doing something right. Um, I'd be shocked if he's not a Hall of Famer um, and, and being enshrined in Canton. And 
Um, you know, now that he's in the College Football Hall of Fame, it's it's it's, it's another just a good feeling for this program. Um, and it helped it, it, believe it or not, it should be easier to it, you can use it to help recruit because you can say you've got 11 Hall of Famers. I don't know how many programs that don't have national championships, haven't won a conference championship in 42 years, can say they got 11 Hall of Famers on the college football Hall of Fame. So, um, it's it's it's, it's a much deserved honor. Um, and I just can't wait to see the year of love and appreciation that's in store for Julius Peppers. Well, that's the thing, man. It's going to be a whole year. He actually, by the way, is the 10th representative. I, be- I-, I read it wrong. I believe that uh, I- when I read it, I thought they said that it was uh, 10 before him. But he joins Harris Barton, who just recently went in for Carolina, Dre Bly, uh, William Fuller, Charlie Justice, and Don McCauley, uh, or uh, Art Wiener as well. Uh, as the seven players that have been inducted, Mac Brown, the current head coach of the Tar Heels, Jim Snavely, and Jim Tatum are the coaches that have gone in for Carolina. Um, and, and, yeah, when you look at it, I mean, look, this is the ultimate question. Lawrence Taylor was a guy that I think was better when he got to the NFL. I mean, he was – he's truly – I mean, he might be the best defensive player that's ever played in the history of the league. Um, where, I mean, Julius Peppers is up there, but I don't know if you would put him in that category. I think he's close, but he's probably in that second tier in terms of defensive players all time. And then you got Dre Bly with what he did at the college level. When you look at those three players, who do you ultimately think was the greatest defensive player during their college career at Carolina? It might be unfair. I'll, I'll lean Lawrence Taylor because he was a part of an ACC championship. Um, something that Dre Bly and Julius Peppers weren't. I think Dre Bly played on the the team that had the best chance to win a conference championship. Of course, Carolina was in the discussion to compete for a national championship um, during his time on campus. Ultimately, didn't get the job done. But you know, whether you, you, you know uh, from an individual standpoint, LT was just as dominant as these guys were, and it led to more uh, on field success. So. It's a slim margin. It's a thin margin, but um, you know you 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 want to see overall success be a part of individual dominance. And Taylor's led to a conference championship, while the other two did not. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's definitely a solid argument. I think if you just look at the actual players, some of the stats, the impact, I think you know. I mean, Julius Peppers was was fantastic. I would probably have him third on the list. The thing that's really interesting about Lawrence Taylor is if you go back and and look at what he did in his time at Carolina, he was two different players while he was at Carolina. He started as a traditional inside linebacker, ton of tackles, led the team over 100 tackles. He then moves to edge rusher and makes a huge impact there. So, I mean, I think he's probably right there. I would say Dre Bly, though, because you look at the impact that he had immediately. The only three-time unanimous All-American in the history of Carolina football, 11 interceptions in a single season. And believe it or not, that was his first uh, season as an impact player. 20 in his career, which easily, I mean, both the single season and the career number or the best marks in school history, you would imagine that no one is really going to come anywhere close to touching those anytime soon uh, with, with the lack of defensive stars that we've really seen from this group. So I would probably go Dre Bly, but um, I, I think it's really close. And the fact that you have three great players like that, I think really just shows you how special the Carolina defenses were at one time. And who knows, maybe one day Jeff Collins – or can get Carolina back to that point. Maybe there'll be some players that will turn into those types of players. We can only cross our fingers and hope. Let's head over and talk about the transfer portal, though. And uh, look, I mean, th- this team really may be looking to add some guys on that defensive side of the ball now that they have their new defensive coordinator. But the last two additions that they've made in the transfer portal have come on the offensive side of the ball. They added offensive tackle Howard Sampson 
last week, got him to flip his commitment from TCU. This was a guy that Carolina was in on immediately once he entered the transfer portal um, out of North Texas. Unfortunately, they did not land him after he took a visit to campus uh, earlier on in the cycle, early in December, but Carolina stayed with it. They kept pushing, and especially after they lost Diego Pounds to the transfer portal, who, as you would predict, went to Ole Miss um, with Lane Kiffin, a lot of NIL money apparently involved there. Howard Sampson now is the guy that Carolina has brought in. I, I don't really know if they're tabbing him as the guy that can be a replacement. I find that incredibly hard to believe. The kid is two years into his college career, and he's played in four games. And, I mean, look, he, he played well at the end of the season last year uh, or this past season for North Texas, but it's North Texas. The fact that he wasn't starting the majority of the season probably tells you a lot. Uh, and I, I just, to me, I don't see how this is seen as a surefire solution if that's what Carolina is thinking. Um, you know, hopefully he's a guy that can develop. I think ultimately that's why you would bring him in on the offensive line. But this is one of those ones that, to me, if the staff's looking at him as the solution at either right or, God forbid, left tackle, um, this this could be a move that could really, really hurt you. And, I, I mean, I know Randy Clements has a good relationship with him. I think a lot of people want to trust Randy Clements with what he's brought in so far. This, this one – this one concerns me just a little bit because I'm worried about the role that they may have lined up for him. I guess it's to be, you know, to be determined. You got to wait and see. Maybe they see something in him that no one else did. And, you know, maybe this is going to be kind of what Carolina's approach is, is getting guys that they feel that they can coach up and develop um, from the group of five level. Um, you know, he did commit to TCU that was just a year away from or a year removed from playing for a national championship. So it's not like they flipped him from some scrub. But, um, you know, I think what Carolina's doing is they're just taking a different approach and, and, and trying to find a different way to evaluate and navigate the portal because they don't have the NIL money that some of these other schools have. And so this is what Carolina is going to have to do. Um, and what you're hoping what you're hoping on and banking on is that the experience on this staff really comes to fruition and they start to evaluate guys uh, that are going to fit in their scheme and fit in what they want to do. And they'll be able to, to get more out of them than what you think as we sit here today. Yeah, well, another guy that I think a lot of people are looking at and hoping that he can do the same is Darwin Barlow, the running back that they got uh, on Thursday night out of USC. Now, this one, I mean, look, I, if you're going to be critical of this move, uh, it, it's you, you're reading too much into this. This is a move that's literally just made so that you have help in the backfield. They wanted some sort of experience back there because Caleb Hood doesn't have a ton of um, he's also a guy that gets banged up very easily. We've seen it throughout his career. Um, and, and look, you've got two guys that I think you really like in red, uh, soon-to-be redshirt freshman Jordan Louie and incoming true freshman Davian Gauss. But the thing is, is they don't have experience and you need somebody that is going to be, that, that you know will be a surefire guy that can handle some reps in the backfield if for some reason Amari and Hampton isn't able to stay as healthy as he did this year. And also, there's just times where you're going to have to give Amari and Hampton a little bit of a blow, especially if you are going to be running him as much as we think they could next season with their offense likely being built around him. Now, Barlow was a guy originally started at TCU, had a really productive year in 2020 where he ran for over 400 yards um, and, and found the end zone four times. He then goes on to USC, doesn't really do a whole lot at USC, uh, but did find the end zone a lot here in the last few years after you know running for over 200 yards back in 2021. The last two years, though, he has only carried the ball a combined 24 times, so he's just kind of gotten buried on the depth chart there 
you know that USC always a spot that brings in a lot of running back talent. And he was one of the guys that just kind of got sorted down into that third and fourth role on the depth chart. And so now Carolina brings him in. I like it. I think it's just an experienced guy that, that can help you out a little bit. And look, here's the thing about it. You brought him in. He's got one year remaining. Let's say that for some reason Jordan Louie or Davian Gauss beats him out right away because they're just that talented. Well, then guess what? Hey, you brought him in. You have him on the roster if you need him. But ultimately, even if you don't use him, at least you have a guy that you know has played college football before, has taken some important snaps before that can take handoffs in the backfield, especially if Caleb Hood uh, doesn't remain at Carolina. Now, I haven't seen anything on this since the bowl game, but one of the things that was pointed out, Michael Coe uh, of WCHL Chapelboro was the first one to point it out at the bowl game, was that Caleb Hood was not dressed, and it did not seem like he was on the sidelines for Carolina in that game. Now, you would imagine that if he was entering the transfer portal, he would be in there by now. Uh, but, I mean, look, Carolina has seen other guys that have entered the transfer portal here recently. Uh, Chance Carroll was the latest guy that entered, although he is a graduate student, so maybe that's part of the reason why. Um, but, yeah, this, uh, to me, I, I think this is a solid addition, especially if a guy like Caleb Hood is to enter the transfer portal either now or after spring practice when that second window opens up. Yeah, you can't go wrong adding a guy that's been around, that's done it at the Power 5 level, at least, you know, knows what it takes to prepare, keep his body right, and be a dude that can spell Amari and Hampton. And the good news is, is he doesn't have, he doesn't have a lot of wear and tear on his body either. This isn't a guy that, that's got the workload that, you know, some other running backs in the portal have. And so if you want to open up a bigger role for him, he's going to be pretty fresh. Um, he still probably has a lot of tread on those tires. So, um, you know, it's 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 a depth move, but football is a game of attrition. And you want to make sure you're prepared because if you're giving the ball to Marion Hampton 24, 26, 28 times a game, you're going to need to spell him a time or two. And I think you'd rather spell him with a veteran as, a, as, a, as, as opposed to an unproven either redshirt or true freshman. Well, and the thing is, is like, look, like I said, if one of those guys is just that good, they beat him out, then it's fine. But you want to have somebody in that backfield that you know, especially early in the season, is going to be able to handle those snaps. And look, with the amount of times that Amari and Hampton carried the ball this past year, the amount of times that we think he could carry it this year, and then the fact that the way that he has to run, now you're hoping that your offensive line is better. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, you were in the bottom third of the country in terms of yards before contact. So he's a guy that has to literally run through defenders over and over again. Eventually, I mean, that could wear on a dude's body. He could get banged up. You need to have somebody in there that you know, if you need to throw them out there to take snaps, they can do it. But at the same time, the other interesting thing that you have to do here, especially in the modern era, you don't want to bring in somebody that is too good because then basically you're saying to Hampton, well, this is a guy that's going to be competing for reps with you. This is a guy that won't really make that sort of threat to Hampton. Hampton's clearly going to be the number one guy, but if you need him, he's capable of carrying the football and doing it at a pretty decent level. Um, the one guy that is visiting campus over the weekend for Carolina as of right now is their only target uh, in this transfer window. Uh, is Ja'Kia Leftwich the transfer offensive tackle from Georgia Tech. Now, I know a lot of people just like the fact that Carolina is looking to bring in a body. I, I got to be honest, I don't really get this one at all. He's a guy that has been in the ACC before, and maybe that's the reason that they're looking at it. But I got to be honest, his numbers are horrible. Like, this is a guy that allowed 16 pressures a year ago, allowed multiple sacks. This is basically a worse version of what you already had there. Like him and Spencer Rollins' numbers are very similar. Um, his run blocking grade is god awful. I mean, we're talking in the high 40s. Um, I, I don't, to me, I, I just, I don't understand that move. And when you couple it with Samson, a guy that you're just taking a shot in the dark on because, 
Randy Ke- Randy Clements recruited him, or I don't even know, remember if Randy Clements recruited him. I think he might have been recruited by a previous staff member, and Clements just coached him. The reason that they are so enticed with him is because of his size at 6'8". Um, and and then Leftwich, a guy who's been in the ACC for years now and hasn't really done anything. I mean, there's other options out there, but I mean, I guess at this point, I mean, is it just that the NIL is that pathetic? I, I just, I, I don't understand this move at all. And it's nothing personal against the kid, but I think for him, he's entering the transfer portal because he should be a guy that's going down to the group of five level, not a guy that is coming in and playing at another ACC school and one that is probably desperate for guys that can actually start this season. Yeah, I mean, like I know the numbers suggest maybe he needs to take a step down. Maybe the staff looks at him and says he was in a scheme that that didn't fit him and his abilities. And you got to remember, like Chip Lindsey didn't inherit an offensive line that fit the way he wanted to – he wants to play. And so maybe you're trying to go get guys that Chip Lindsey wants up front to see what his offense is going is going to look like because you know I think last year was just a makeshift for a makeshift version of it because you had Drake May at quarterback um, and, and so even though Carolina ran the ball ran the ball well um, it probably looked different than what it's looked in years past because he hasn't had a top three draft pick. You know, and, and you know, and, uh, under center taking snaps. So, um, yeah, I guess this is one that if, if he commits, you got you got to wait and see. But what the staff has done is that because of the way that they've they've, they've gone about this, if you go up to these guys and you miss, and they don't improve the offensive line, it's just going to raise the criticism, and. Uh, you know, make it easier to critique the way that Mac Brown is running his program. So, I mean, luckily he hasn't committed to Carolina. Uh, maybe he does over the weekend, and I guess if he does, we'll have to wait and see if we get a different version of him in Chapel Hill than what we saw in Atlanta for the past couple of years. And look, the scheme thing with Chip Lindsey, I, I think, makes a, a lot of sense. But my knowledge of what Chip Lindsey's offenses used to be are are really good running games that allow the passing game to build off of them. I mean the numbers are not great as a run blocker. Like it's it's there. And I just I I I want this team especially on the offensive line. Some of the other spots I get it if you're not aggressive. Like yeah I want somebody in that defensive line room particular particularly someone in the middle at defensive tackle. But if they don't land that guy, you've got enough guys in that room. You've got some freshmen that are coming in. It's just time for guys to step up. And it's time for Ted Monachino to step in and hopefully develop these guys the way that Tim Cross wasn't able to. The offensive line, look at all the different bodies that you're losing in that room. You got one starter that's coming back from this past year. Now, granted, it's your best offensive lineman by far in Willie Lampkin, but he's a guy that is going to probably have to move from right guard to center. And with that, that means you need two starting guards. You need two starting tackles. I look at the tackle spot, and I like Travion Green. I think he's a guy. Now, the thing with him is health. He's been banged up. Uh, a lot of different times during spring practice, fall camp. Hopefully he's a guy that's able to stay healthy because as a player, a lot of the stuff that we've heard about him, a lot of the stuff that we've seen from him when he's been out there, especially during uh, spring games and stuff like that, he's looked pretty good. I think you could probably get away with playing him. To me, I would probably feel most comfortable with playing him at right tackle. But, hey, if you got to play him at left tackle, you probably got no choice. Um, but you need a, a guy that's a legitimate starter. I don't think Leftwich is that guy. I don't think Sampson is that guy right now. I think Sampson's a guy you got to wait to see develop. Leftwich is a guy you're not going to have much time. You better pray that he just finds a way uh, to turn out uh, to be better than you thought. Interior-wise, they haven't brought anybody in, and that just completely baffles me. 
because I don't understand who they trust on the interior of this group. I, I want to believe that Zach Rice can make the leap, and I think it's possible. I mean, look, he's a guy that was a five-star. Um, I think, you know, it's taken him some time to transition because he was a tackle, primarily a left tackle in high school, and we all thought that was the position he was going to play, but they kicked him inside the guard and pretty much told him, look, you've got to be able to step up and play that guard position for us. That's where we need you. Well, hopefully he takes that leap this year. Jonathan Adorno, I mean, he's been there. This, I think this is his fourth year, possibly even his fifth year, and we've just never really seen him put it all together. I don't know if he's a guy that's a starter at this level, but now you're going to be forcing him to basically become a starter. So to me, I mean, that's the position that I'm most frustrated with, and that's the one that makes me bring up this question. Are we really okay with the approach that Carolina is taking so far in this portal window? Because I feel like there have been some opportunities for Carolina out there. Um, I still feel like, you know, I've, I've, I've got guys, I've got an article that I'm going to be putting up here looking at some of the offensive line targets that I think Carolina should go after. Um, some, some guys in the portal that are still available that I think would really help this group. That's the unit right now that I'm most frustrated with because I just don't think that – this staff is really valuing what is an extremely important part of this team's success next year and moving forward because you got to be able to protect a quarterback that's probably not going to be the type of player that we saw Sam Howell and Drake may be at quarterback for the last five years. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to, to, to question the way they're going about it. But maybe, you know, I don't think it's from a lack of effort. I think they're getting they're getting feedback that's telling them there's no point in going after X, Y, and Z. And this is what happens when you're no longer the cool place to be, the fun place to be. That was Carolina when Mac Brown first came back. There was a lot of energy, positive energy, momentum around the program. You get the quarterback right. All of a sudden, in the transfer portal era, you become a destination place for a lot of players, a chance to play with a Sam Howell and or a Drake May. Now that's gone. Um, and you, you've you gone through both those quarterbacks, and this is where not winning anything makes it that much harder. And, and so I don't think it's from a lack of effort on the staff's part. I think this is just the reality of the situation when – you've underachieved the way Carolina has, it's going to be harder for top talent to want to come here. Um, and and it's, it's just, it's a harsh reality is what it is. So, um, you know, now if it comes out that they're just not trying and they're not putting in the work in that area of trying to build their roster, then you have a problem. I don't think that's the issue because we know how, how important, you know, Mac Brown talks about the importance of the transfer portal all the time. So I don't think he's I don't think he's ignoring it. I just think he and his staff aren't getting the the reception that they probably would have gotten in the portal two years ago. I think that's one of the elements. I think there's really three parts to this. I think one, you're right, the you know, bloom is off the rose for Mac Brown and, and this group, this second stint in Chapel Hill. I just, I don't think you're right. I don't think kids look at this and say, this is a great situation anymore. They did when he first came back. They did when, you know, Drake may took over as quarterback, but now they look at it as one of those situations where this team's going through a rebuild. I don't think I can really win much here. And who knows when Mac Brown is going to eventually step away. So if I do commit, even as a transfer, if I have multiple years left, there's a good chance that the guy that's wanting to bring me in and his staff will not be there by the time that I'm in my second or third year here. But I think the other, there, there's a couple other elements. Another one that's key is NIL. I don't think, I think the NIL collective at Carolina, I think it's the, the, the efforts have just been lackluster. I don't think you, you see a lot of the other schools, their collectives are very vocal they have strong leaders of the collectives that are very active, um, That especially when it comes to actually being involved with some of this stuff. Um, and I, I, 
I don't see that from Carolina. Like the heels, heels for life thing was something that just never really took off. I, I want to see there be a little bit more effort from people to rally around that thing. But again, you need a strong leader in that area or else you're simply not going to be able to raise the money that you need to, to bring these guys in. And ultimately the majority of the guys that are in the transfer portal now, that's the biggest thing that matters to them. Yeah. They want to find a school that fits them. Well, they want to find a school that can develop them, but for the right amount of money, they will head out and you lost a guy because you didn't have it, the NIL money. You lost Diego Pounds because Ole Miss was simply willing to pay him more. That's that's the case. Like there was no other reason why Diego Pounds was the was your second best offensive lineman this year. He had a chance to develop into one of your better offensive linemen that you've had during the Mac Brown era, and he ends up leaving for more money. And guess what? Can't blame the kid. If you can't pay, and especially the way Ole Miss is willing to pay, how are you going to say that? This is a kid that should have stuck around and just turned down the money. Carolina's got to make it more of a priority to start raising money on the NIL side of things, especially if you want to compete in football. If you don't, then that's fine. Then you you just have to become content with the fact that you're going to basically become what Indiana football is, what Kansas football has been for a while, although that seems like that could potentially be changing a little bit. That's That's what you're going to have to come to terms with. The, uh, the third element of this is that I do think that Mac Brown and his staff value high school recruiting maybe a little bit too much. And I think a part of it is that, you know, they bring in 27 guys in this class. I, I think you could have used some of those scholarships on transfer portal players. And you knew you were going to lose so many guys to graduation. You knew there was a chance that you were going to lose some guys to the NFL early. And they decided we're going to try to fill all those spots with high school guys, which is normally fine. But in this era, you know that, I mean, look, a third of those guys probably won't even finish their careers with you. They will be in the transfer portal at some point. So to me, I think you have to value the transfer portal almost more than you value high school recruiting. It's a sad state of reality. It's horrible for the high school kids. But in terms of actually being able to win, I think that Mac Brown and his staff moving forward have to learn that you have to keep spots open. And look, does that mean that maybe you have to be more aggressive in, you know, the late signing period on the high school trail? If you, if you don't end up getting some of the guys in the portal that you want, certainly that's a possibility. But I think this time around, I think they may have messed up and gotten too many guys straight out of high school that really won't be able to help this team because they're not recruiting at the same level that they were early on in the Mac Brown tenure. They, they won't be able to help Carolina for probably two, three years, and it's put this, this team in a bad spot in a year that, got to tell you, this is a pretty crucial year for Mac Brown and his staff. If this one goes wrong, it's hard to think that Mac Brown won't be pushed towards having to retire at the end of the season. Uh, I hear you on the NIL. Here's the problem. It's why it needs to be regulated. It's why there needs to be some sort of uniform policy because, yeah, Carolina's at a disadvantage from an NIL standpoint um, because they don't have the boosters – and the the money that other programs have. And that's okay. Like, this is an issue that Alabama ran into. Like, Nick Saban and his six national championships may, in the NIL world forced him to get behind a microphone and say, we need more money, which is a problem because Alabama should never have to have more money to get the, the players that they want, the players that you need to win there. So um, this is why, like, yes, on the forefront, when um, the NIL became legal, it was celebrated because the kids deserve the right to make money. You know, this is a billion-dollar industry that it is, you know, that the money's being made off of what they're doing on an athletic playing surface. But it put schools like Carolina at a disadvantage that just simply doesn't have 
the the booster and alumni money coming into it that other schools have. And um, so you can criticize the NIL and you can complain about it, but that was just always in just always in the cards. The second that it became a thing, it put the university uh, at a disadvantage. And you know, if you, I could only I, I can't help but think that if there was uh, a policy that was like a salary cap or whatever it is, however they find a way to police it, maybe this doesn't it's not happening at the level that it's happening where you're seeing kids simply leave for money um, because that's not what college athletics, uh, is supposed to be about. And then when you talk about recruiting, you're right. Um, you you probably should have left three to four scholarships available for the transfer portal. But if you don't have the NIL money, this is the way you're going to have to work. That, like, it, that's him combating it. He knows he can't go in the portal and get eight to ten guys. And you you want to have the bodies on your roster uh, when the season starts. So you got to go recruit them out of high school knowing that probably a third of them, as you mentioned, are probably uh, not going to be here by the, by the time their senior year rolls around. And so um, it's, it's why, you know, the, the, the portal is something that, yes, I agree with, but it still needs to be policed and needs to be regulated um, because it's going to hurt schools like Carolina, the Alabamas, the Ohio States, the Michigans, the Texases, those schools are never going to have a problem reloading because they can get the talent they want out of high school and they can go get the talent that they want out of the transfer portal. But some of these, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, some of these mid-tier programs that want to take that next step in the NIL world, now they're at a disadvantage. And and so I think that um, as long as Mac Brown is the head coach, Carolina will be a, primarily they'll recruit through the high school ranks. Um, because that's how he and his staff are going to do things. You're probably going to wait till Carolina's next hire before you look at the program becoming uh, one that splits up its recruiting with high school players and established college players. Yeah, and, and you got to also look at the boosters and hope they get more aggressive. Um, and the thing is, is that, look, if the boosters are going to be aggressive of trying to get a coach out, which could eventually happen, well, then you should be aggressive at putting your money towards NIL to help the next coach that comes in if he wants to be aggressive in the transfer portal. Um, that That's, you know, kind of the catch-22, but you're right. I think what, what you're going to see in college football that, that's going to end up happening, and you're seeing it already, yes, you're right. The powers, the normal powers are going to stay in place because they've done so much winning that even if they're not able to pay guys like at Bama, um, I think, you know, Georgia, I don't think really has that much of an issue with paying guys, but those schools, yeah, they might not have the money that say a Texas, Oregon, those types of schools have, but they have tradition. They've won. Guys will want to play there. They'll be willing to take less money because they know, Hey, we're going to have a chance to win a championship. What you're going to see happen is if you don't have a ton of NIL money, if your boosters aren't, uh, just hugely invested you will not be a team that can build yourself into one of those teams. You you have to have a, a huge NIL collectives that are willing to pay transfers or else you cannot develop into one of those national title contenders. Where in the past, there were teams that legitimately could just build through the high school ranks. Even when the transfer portal originally opened, you could get a couple of guys in there and not have to pay them a ton of NIL money. And those were teams that could develop into national championship caliber teams or at least college football playoff caliber teams now and you know the expanded playoff will certainly help but for Carolina I mean it's going to be an extreme challenge you just need to hit it out of the park with these high school guys and you know hope that your staff can just develop some guys that really aren't going to be as talented as some of the other guys the other uh, players on rosters even in your own conference so we'll see. This staff has a lot of work ahead of them. We'll be keeping you up to date on everything over on the website, HeelToughBlog.com. As I mentioned, going to have an article going up looking at some of the offensive line guys that are still available in the portal that I think Carolina should at least look into. Uh, they need help there. I'm sorry to admit it to people, but 
this is not the offensive line that Carolina needs in front of whoever their starting quarterback is going to be next year. So I lay out some of the guys that I think Carolina should take a serious look at. Um, you know, other stuff that's up there, of course, breakdowns of Howard Sampson, da uh, Darwin Barlow, and their commitments to Carolina. Um, and, of course, uh, plenty of other stuff that we'll be keeping you up to date on. A bunch of guys going to the NFL that have graduated. The latest today was Ed Montalus. I'll get an article up about him pursuing an NFL career. Uh, really, the most that we've seen of guys that have graduated, uh, usually you see a lot of guys that just kind of move on from football. But a lot of guys throwing their hat into the ring uh, that will be out there on pro day attempting to make it to the NFL. And one other, one other cool note that I did want to point out before we got out of here. Cool story that uh, I saw earlier today. The, tar the uh, Carolina football account retweeted it. Uh, former quarterback Russell Tabor, who was a walk-on for the team, never really saw a ton of action. Local kid here in Charlotte, played at Charlotte Country Day. He actually has gotten the opportunity to play in the professional uh, American Football League over in Spain. Uh, very interesting. Did not expect that for him. Um, but uh, that is a great opportunity for him. Um, wishing him the best in, in that. Uh, and it'll be interesting to monitor him. We've seen Tariel players go all over the place. A lot of guys that have gone to the Canadian Football League. We've seen uh, you know, some of the iterations of the Spring League, like the USFL, the XFL. I've had some former Tario players. And, of course, guys that are in the NFL. But this is a pretty cool one, going over to Europe, getting an opportunity to play over there. So we wish you the best, Russell. That's a really cool opportunity for you. So uh, that's going to wrap it up tonight for this edition of the podcast, guys. I uh, want to thank Josh for hosting with me. want to thank you guys for watching and listening. And as always, go Tar Heels.